Okay, Tanzel, are you okay if we start? Yeah, I'm, in, I'm ready to go, so. Okay. Um, look, I want to, first of all, welcome uh, everybody to this uh, seminar. Uh, it's good to see a, a few faces we haven't seen before um, and some more familiar ones. Um, I first, this is the uh, final um, presentation of the, the findings of the PhD by Tansel Shafiq called Desiring Karel. Um, and Karel, of course, is a, a, a very large informal settlement in Dhaka. And uh, so, but before we uh, welcome uh, and ask uh, Tanzel to talk, I just wanted to um, to acknowledge my, my co. I, I was the super the main supervisor of this thesis, and my co supervisor was Dr. David Week, who's also here today. And I also wanted to welcome the uh, committee members who uh, had have helped with this thesis on the way through, um, Professor Ross King. Uh, and um, Dr. Brian Cook, who are also both with us today, and hope that we can, they can, all, and and the rest of you will all join us in the discussion after um, Tanzel presents about forty minutes of his findings. So over to Tanzel, and can I ask everybody to make sure that their microphones are muted throughout the presentation, and unless you're asking a question, thank you. Right. Um, uh, let me start the timer. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Kim, for the introduction. Uh, I have a lot of ground to cover, so I'll get right to it. So this is Karail, the protagonist of today's story. In 2001, its western side is largely a lake. Incrementally since then, the settlement expands infills and densifies into the largest informal settlement in Dhaka. And the question is, how? In this thesis, I'll provide an in-depth case study of Karail, analyzing the morphogenesis, that is the production of its urban form, over the last 18 years by tracing morphological change, investigating the social processes, and exploring the underlying forces, the desires that shape the urban production. To do that, Part one uh, of the presentation will provide the context of the st study, looking into the background of the settlement, the conceptual framework used, and the glimpse of the methodology. Uh, this will be followed by key findings in part two and the concluding discussion in part three. Now, as you can see in the key map to the right, the larger settlement extends over an area of 35 hectares that's one-tenth of Central Park in New York or twice that of Melbourne Zoo. And its current population is about 300,000. It's surrounded by formerly planned neighborhoods, some of which are the most expensive in Dhaka, as well as the offices of the state, some state agencies to the north. However, rather than just the size, Karail is interesting for us due to the emergence of a remarkable urban complexity in the last 40 years a hierarchical road network, a diverse typology of housing options, uh, uh, a diverse functional mix, public open spaces and infrastructural adaptations. The focus today will be towards the more recent Western side, as you can see uh, denoted by the yellow box on the left. Now it must be noted here that Karail technically is a squatter settlement. By and large, it's built form is on the land owned by different state agencies. The map on the right shows the future plan by those agencies, a software IT park uh, and lake beautification project at the expense of evicting the settlement. The people have, of Karail have persisted so far despite such fears. I must acknowledge their help in producing this study despite their precarious condition. Now, if we zoom out, and take a look at slums, quote unquote, in Dhaka at a metropolitan scale, it's immediately evident why Karail's land is so desirable. It is located centrally, as opposed to many such settlements being in the urban fringes. It is located, uh, there are about 5,000 such communities across Dhaka, and most being much smaller than Karail, uh, providing essentially a form of affordable housing to more than 4.5 million people. Uh, roughly the people in, Metro, uh, in, in Melbourne. Um, 
Now, a crucial conceptual distinction must be made here. I do not use informal settlement as a euphemism for slum to describe Karal. The first is a mode of production and the latter is a descriptor for physical and so social condition. Indeed, as this map shows at the same scale, once the neighborhoods planned by the state and large scale developers are blocked off, which is the red areas, the rest of the city, the irregular morphology of the rest of the city reveals that much of it has been produced informally. Such informal production is now the major mode of urban development in the global south. Three billion people are expected to be living in such settlements by 2050, half the urban world, which effectively is 200,000 people settling informally every single day for the next 30 years. And yet we really know very little how that production works. Now, there are two strands of how urban informality is broadly conceptualized. For many, this new world constitutes an apocalyptic scenario, a planet of slums, a perpetual challenge that indicates the failure of neoliberalism. On the other hand, for some, such settlements are places of inventiveness and unrecognized capital in need of inclusion into the formal market. Now, both these trends are geared toward the socioeconomic understanding without much to do with speciality. Now, on the other hand, one can clearly see that the most of our uh, urban design disciplinary knowledge is go geared towards formal and Western cities. Uh, the upper half of this diagram. Uh, moreover, uh, urban morphological studies maintains the same social spatial binary and is geared towards a more spatial understanding at the expense of the social dynamics that underlie the urban production. Now, to explain the informal urban production, most often we resort to all encompassing words such as, you know, these are self-organized, they're spontaneous, they're organic. And by the end of this presentation, I hope to convince you that there are no such singular self-organization. It's, it's a fallacy and only what we have in reality are a multiplicity of processes. Therefore, in summary, the key points of departure for this study are as follows. The investigation will move beyond the social spatial binary and see urban form not as an object, but as a manifestation of underlying processes and different sets of relations. Now, such an ontological ground for this study is informed by the philosophical work of Deleuze and Guattari, in particular, their articulation of assemblage thinking. Now, assemblages allow us to think through relations between things rather than things in themselves. And moreover, it allows us to think in terms of processes. One could re-describe the world as sets of relations between different bodies and expressions between the material and the semiotic. The vertical axis determines how processes are either making the assemblage more homogeneous or uh, as it's known, territorialized or heterogeneous uh, or deterritorialized. De the assemblage is rather like the blueprint of how different entities come together to produce something else. In more concrete terms for our purposes here, the urban production that we see in Karail can be seen as more than just the physical form changing and it would have us look for mechanisms that are operating underneath. Now, what is underneath that formal morphological change can be interrogated more specifically if we draw out three particular aspects that all assemblages share. That's roles, desires, and rules. The framework for this study then would posit that morphological changes that we see are being generated by an intersecting field of desires uh, uh, by tendencies and capacities of the multiple actors, both human and non-human. Now, these practices are codified by rules as in social norms, heurist heuristics, or even explicit directives, and then are enacted by specific roles who act as intercessors of the assemblage. Therefore, such a framework allows us to expand the research question into multiple lines of inquiry, to look at morphological change and categorize that, to look at the different roles, uh, to uh, unearth the desires, and of course, look for social rules that inform the morphogenesis.
uh, but I do not take it as a hypothesis that I need to test for the rest of the study. But rather, it's a, these are lines of inquiry, tools for generating an abductive explanation of what is going on in Karail. Such a plural set of inquiries requires both spatial and social sets of knowledge. Therefore, a mixed method research methodology was adopted for the case study and fieldwork investigation. The key methods for collecting the spatial data were archival research, morphological mapping, photographic survey, uh, and participatory mapping with the community. For understanding the social aspects, a microethnographic set of methods were employed, which included detailed in, uh, interviews and long conversations, focus group discussions, and embedded observations. Now, the, the mapping was con uh, conducted at five particular scales, uh, as each uh, scale registered different sets of information that you see listed here. Uh, it allowed linking, for example, uh, you know, geographical features, say, at the metropolitan scale with changes observed at the smallest building scale. The on-site mapping was phase one of the field work. The insights from the mapping was then used to guide the social data collection in phase two, uh, different practices regarding the built environment, key informants and groups were identified during the mapping. And many of the interviews and discussions were much more feasible towards the end because uh, increased access and trust from the community members. Now, indeed working with the community to collectively reflect and arrive at answers was key to the fieldwork process. So um, uh, six months of fieldwork now, the empirical findings from the fieldwork are then organized into three key sections, uh, built form, use, and control. And this is drawing from Habrakin's uh, uh, threefold structure of the built environment. Now, these sets of inquiries about roles, desires, and uh, uh, rules uh, remain valid for each. So that's how the findings are organized. And now we move on to the, the key findings. Um, and we start with the buildings. So the settlement coverage, as you can see in this map, in the sets of map, shows the extent of the settlement in each of these years for every available year between 2001 to 2018, indicating the rate of growth spatially. And the average rate of settlement coverage has been about half a hectare per year. But the average isn't very hel helpful to understand the growth in time. Once the yearly increments are plotted, it becomes apparent that the settlement grew at varying rates over the years, initially even reducing in its footprint. But most interestingly, it allows us to raise key morphogenic questions. For example, what happened in 2014? What changed in the production process to account for su the sudden growth spurt? Why were certain years so stagnant in producing urban form? Yeah, sure it's rubbish. If we zoom down into the neighborhood scale, uh, can, can, and, I, can I wait a second? Uh, can I please ask everyone to mute themselves? Sorry, Sebastian, uh, could you mute yourself? Thanks. So if we zoom down into the neighborhood scale and plot the buildings according to the, their age, the morphogenic building footprint, uh, yellow the oldest and the red the latest, it reveals an uneven geography of growth. For example, the northern neighborhoods produced much larger areas in a shorter period of time than the southern ones. A clear variation of morphological pattern can be noticed as well. In the northeast, a more granular pattern uh, of uh, 15 meter buildings can be observed, while on the western fringe, uh, there are elongated clusters of up to even 60 meters. But interest, uh, the question is, what are they made of? Now, at the smallest scale of the building themselves, there is a prevalence of one room being used as an apartment, which I call the single room dwelling unit, the red dots. You can see an actual plan of such an arrangement to the left. Each room houses a family with multiple SRDUs uh, sharing common facilities such as kitchens and toilets, shown in blue. And often there is a common gate as well. This cluster formation is the fundamental morphological rule observed in Karail 
which uses the room as the morphogenic unit. Now, if we see at a larger scale and uh, in the four street scale case study, that's 50 meter by 100 meter, and you can see the key map on the right, this one rule can be seen manifested in many different morphological combinations. The clustering ranges from a single room up to even 50 rooms, uh, as you see here. It's interesting to note, however, it's interesting to note the prevalence of eight units together. Now, that brings us to why. What are the socio-spatial factors that regulate the cluster size? So now there are many factors that contribute to the clustering, such as availability of resources, material constraints, and even the gender of the, uh, of the owner. But crucially, an overarching factor is what I call the social limit of sharing common facilities. The map here shows a very even distribution of the services, stove points, toilets, and wash areas, and a ratio of one toilet to eight rooms is strictly maintained across all neighborhoods. In other words, larger clusters will often have multiple, uh, uh, will have units in multiples of eights as to maximize the use of the shared toilet facilities. And this is so as often the toilet is the most expensive investment. Now, the materiality and technology of construction has changed over the years, resulting in major morphological changes. The trend has been from light and temporary materials to more sturdy construction as you, can, as you go down this list. And often is uh, positively correlated with stronger perception of tenure. Often the new technology or material is related to the building practices in the place of origin of the migrant resident or builder. For example, the first two-story timber houses in Karel were built by migrants from the south of Bangladesh, where it's more prevalent. And automatically that timber construction restricted the urban form at two storage, stopping further vertical intensification. And that's actually a good example of the uh, timber construction that uh, you often will see in Karel. Now we move on to the streets and laneways. And the image, uh, as I've said, is a good example. Uh, so moving on to the streets and laneways, uh, first we look at the access network zooming out at a larger settlement scale. The red showing the public city streets outside of Karail, and the white shows the internal street morphology to the settlement. Two things are apparent. Now, Karail has been effectively made into a ghetto with only one public street connecting it to the rest of the city. And second, uh, secondly, contrary to some other informal settlements, the grid iron pattern of the formal city has had almost no effect on the local street morphology. If we, zoom, if we uh, look at the neighborhood scale and plot the emergence of the street network, red showing the newest and yellow the oldest, we see extension of already established routes rather than any significant reblocking. The prevalent structure is a fishbone pattern, except the northern one, uh, uh, northern ones slowly connecting to form uh, uh, an emergent grid, as you can see towards the north. In terms of width, often the determining rule is the ease of access of two-way pedestrian traffic and in some cases rickshaws, uh, the three-wheelers that you see in the streets of Dhaka. How the street layouts were decided and upgraded in each neighborhood points to different forms of organization. Some done by citizens collectively, some unilaterally by local leaders, and some by NGOs. Now, this is key to understanding the morphogenesis, and I will uh, pick this up towards the end in the discussion. Now, note that this map was uh, uh, based on a Google Earth satellite image, and if I mapped the same area when I mapped it on site, it showed a much finer access network. The public streets here, shown in orange, uh, within, the, uh, within Karail, and the communal internal corridors in gray together create a permeable urban tissue. In most cases, these communal corridors have gates which are kept open during the day. These corridors become an extension of the public laneway since the open gate marks a sign of acceptance of a pedestrian walking through, but only given that you know them by their face. <laughs> 
then social capital becomes a determining factor for the accessibility in what can be termed as a relational access network. So it's accessible if you know people. So over time, many of the communal internal corridors change into public laneways. Now, moving on to the production of land. Uh, to the left, the extent map clearly demonstrates that the land filling was mediated by the public gaze. The part of the lake more internal to the settlement was filled up while the side facing the city, uh, the, the affluent part, had only intermittent and very small expansions. Zooming into the neighborhood scale to the right, one can see uh, uh, over time, the production of land is demonstrably more towards the north where the land actually preceded the buildings. In the southern areas, often, interestingly, the building was built first on stilts and then the land produced much later. Now, if we look in detail, if we look in detail at the process of land formation and the material ecology, uh, on the left, that's me actually following a rickshaw van on its way to Kral carrying the infill material. The infill material is actually building debris and construction waste collected from the formal city. In other words, the construction waste is handled by these informal laborers who then actually sell it, uh, sell the waste to local builders to form the land. In the image to the right, this land was just being prepared for building a house. Now, if we move on to the way uh, the use of the built form shapes the morphogenesis, particularly I'll focus on the functional mix of building and briefly talk about activities in public space. So the primary function in the settlement has always been residential, here uh, coded uh, in red. Uh, and as the sequence of maps show, over time, the settlement has diversified with particular uh, functional outcomes uh, so it, the functions are mapped according to a live, work, visit uh, triangulation that you can see here. And uh, the visit functions, uh, as you can see, are in green. So what is clearly uh, visible in the map is the main access route towards the south uh, shows the development of an edge-oriented commercial activity generating a lot of visit function. That's the road down at the south here. Towards the north, which you see uh, historically had been related to work functions, uh, shown by blue, retains some of it over time, but mostly has transformed into housing. Now, key to note here that most of this differentiation has been adaptation of the typical 3 meter by 10 meter housing form into the different functions, as this image of a school being run in a rented house shows the internal layout and facade is changed for commercial functions such as shops, but not large scale interventions. Now, the exception to that is usually the two collective institutions, the mosque and the bazaar, both usually much larger or sturdier than the rest of the urban fabric. Their role in the morphogenesis is beyond the functions they serve. Since both are established through collective collaboration and financial contribution, they are acts of collective intentionality and are key in the formation of a sense of neighborhood. Note that most neighborhoods in Karail are named after the local bazaars, uh, Jamai Bazaar, Bo Bazaar, uh, Musharraf Bazaar. You can see one being built to the left from scratch during my stay in Karail, uh, where the informal vendors on the streets are uh, finally transferred into the, the more formal bazaar. Now, once built, these become the local placemaking anchors. Lastly, the functional mix is not only an internal factor. Karail houses not only people, but thousands of rickshaws as well, serving the formal city. Uh, this complementary functional relationship or a symbiosis has resulted in large scale rickshaw garages particularly towards the north, as the map shows. These garages have spawned a secondary industry catering to their needs. In terms of the morphogenesis, such garages are often the only functions suitable for the freshly produced land, which are over time converted to housing as the land stabilizes. <laughs> 
So now moving on to public space. While the rickshaw garages in the previous slide were open spaces, they were not public. Now, you may think that there are no public spaces in Karail in the, in the dense packing, but as the image on the left show, the residents have adapted many smaller scale spaces into active public spaces. The graph plots these various public spaces according to how coincidental or intentional they were during the morphogenesis, as well as their level of multifunctionality. The largest public spaces, as you can see in the bottom left, are usually intentionally preserved. To stop potential encroachment, they're often part of an institution such as a mosque or a school, and I call this institutional pegging. The contested nature of producing and maintaining public spaces reveals the important role of community leaders and strong internal governance. Which actually brings us to the last set of findings that examines how the built form production is controlled, both at the individual level of the household, which is the tenure condition, and at the collective level, which is the overall governance regime. Now, as the map on the right shows, and I mentioned this before, the entire land is legally owned by the two state agencies. Uh, and therefore, from a legal perspective, the residents in Karail are illegal occupiers. Uh, despite being there for 40 years now, there, since there is no legal national uh, instrument, no legal framework, there is no way to confer any legality to their tenure. Now, it's important to conceptually detach the sense of uh, uh, legality in tenure, so legal tenure, as opposed to de facto tenure. Now, de facto tenure can be described as, uh, you know, how property is possessed and used on the ground in reality. In that sense, Karail has a very well-established system of individually held property rights that operate only within the settlement. A manifestation of such de facto tenure is seen on the right, where residents proudly display their property address and how many rooms they have under his or her tenure. Now, it's, us it's useful to see tenure as a bundle of rights following uh, this uh, coinage by Ostrom, rather than simply meaning ownership. As the table shows, there, the rights includes rights to use, occupy, build, sell, uh, but usually it doesn't include right, or it doesn't have the right to access formal credit, and, and sometimes the right to inherit is, all, is contested. A key social stratification is also observed when tenure is investigated. Roughly 20% of the residents hold tenure of the land, and that, which is why I call them landholders, as opposed to owners or landlord. The rest, 80%, are tenants with much more limited rights. What this means for the control of urban production is that most of the key decisions about the urban fabric are made by a much smaller group, the landholders, who enjoy a higher social status within the community. Now, the question is, what are the morphological traces of such de facto tenure? Now, here are the four street scale case study areas that I've mapped showing the outline of the cadastral parcel, so to speak, held by the individual landholders. Even within the small areas that are mapped, immediately it's clear that the tenure holding is widely varied. And it's, uh, but the median comes to something around an area equivalent to four to 10 rooms. I mean, this disproves the widely held idea that Karail is owned by 70 mafia. That's actually part of the national uh, narrative in Bangladesh, widely perpetuated by the media. Uh, what this shows is a much more egalitarian distribution of land. Now, the, these maps were crucial in investigating how the land was allocated since uh, that determines future urban form and the street layout. Three particular processes were found uh, where self-selected plot of land, uh, uh, secondly, community negotiated or manipulated or outright purchased. Now, now, if we look at the larger governance regime, this brings us to the last set of findings. Uh, as can be seen in the diagram, 
which maps all the various social groups involved, at the bottom, the local landholders and the shop owners, and, and only sometimes even the tenants, form various sets of committees focusing on development, uh, savings, or running the mosque and bazaar. These committees often have ties with actors outside the settlement, the upper half of the diagram, which ends up shaping many of the decisions. Now their relationship can be official or under the table, uh, so to speak. Now a simpler way of looking at the governance is to see three particular tendencies. So the first can be termed as electoral in which a mutually beneficial connection has been established by political parties and local leaders mediated by local party wings. The second tendency can be termed as developmental, typically initiated by large scale service delivery NGOs such as BRAC and often hidden under these first two aspects of governance. The third governing tendency observed in Karel is a more quiet and distributed form of governing relations, a grassroots governance of the everyday life by the various local committees that are not affiliated with the first two. Now, community leaders at the helm of this community, these committees, now, and then you, can, uh, you can sense that it's best if you can be in all three committees at once, eventually have a disproportionately large say in the urban production process. They assume the role of the main intercessor of the assemblages driving the morphogenesis. Now, if we see the spatial, uh, you know, the manifestation of that, we see something like this, that the emergence of the leadership is not just social, but equally spatial. As this map shows, the different territories held and operated by different community leaders, it becomes apparent that there is a form of polycentric and distributed governance. While the leaders perform similar tasks, the control over the built environment is exercised differently, resulting in different rates of growth in different neighborhoods. The urban form bears witness to the territoriality. You can see the morphogenesis being shaped by these invisible fault lines. While the territories change uh, over time, at any given time, they're quite sharp. Everyone knows under whose governance one is. So we finally arrive at the discussion and the task is how do we really tie up all the disparate things that I've described here. So now if we go back to what this thesis was trying to answer, how was Quran produced? I doubt if we can fall back to simply saying it was all self-organized. Instead, as a way to answer that, I suggest using three distinct organizational modes, individualized, collectivized, and syndicated. Now, individualized organization is characterized by urgency and improvisation in the face of subsistence needs. It's marked by minimal coordination and planning between the settlers in producing their housing units. The spatial characteristics are evident in the maps of the earliest neighborhoods in Karal. As you can see in the left in Beltala, the labyrinthine lanes that end abruptly, houses that don't align and services that are built post facto. The initial house locations were all self-selected based on avoiding conflict rather than mediated through an active form of negotiation in between neighbors. There were seldom any previous affiliations between the first settlers. They utilized pre-existing striations such as tracks, lake edges, and boundary walls to or order their urban form. Politically marginal with little social or financial capital, the settlement took place in spaces that attracted the least attention. This perhaps matches by its conception of the quiet encroachment of the ordinary. Indeed, this was the quietest mode. Now, moving on to the second level, collectivist organization can be characterized by joint decision-making between many different settlers. Key features would be community negotiation during settling, anticipation of a much longer stay, relatively equitable distribution of buildings and plots, uh, parity in de facto tenure rights, lack of a strict hierarchy in decision-making, and very strong social norms guiding the settling process. This form of settling is marked by the emergence 
of the plot as the primary spatial device to territorialize the land instead of the buildings. Usually plotting results in a more regular morphological pattern. This is preceded by a high degree of community organizing, dispelling any notion that such forms of settling are only coincidental or unplanned. The formation of Bow Bazaar neighborhood, as you can see to the left here, illustrates such forms of collectivized, uh, collectivization. The allocation of land was by an overnight occupation of an unused stretch of land by 35 local renters. The plots were distributed equally amongst them in these thin slices. Uh, the synchronous occupation happened after a month long planning exercise. However, these uh, collectivized organizations in Karail also have happened sequentially and not as dramatic as an overnight occupation. Collectivization can be linked to Ostrom's description of successful management of common pool resources. The characteristics are similar, clear demarcation of territories, participation in rulemaking, and uh, lack of any top-down authority. Now, the third tier of organization is when urban production becomes centralized in the hands of a few particular agents with the highest financial and political capital forming a syndicate. Land is treated as a resource for extracting profit by maximizing housing units. The result is a more regularized and repetitive urban form, as you can see to the left, speculative landfilling, uh, predetermined street networks, and extractive sale of land. Now, the wider and regularized street network and standardized buildings are only necessary technologies to ensure the fastest rate of production. Now remember that this neighborhood grew the fastest in the last five years. Certain local leaders here use their political capital to take hold of the entire lake edge, the northern lake edge. They filled the lake in increments of roughly four rooms, developed the housing units and sold them. Often they resorted to coercive means, manipulation and even violence to take control of the land. Most decisions regarding the neighborhood were planned by them usually to expand the profit margin. The excess capital allowed reaching into the state apparatus, befriending police and politicians alike, and thus expanding the syndicate and continuing the urban production. Now, these organization levels can be seen in the form of increasing levels of territorialization. Uh, at the bottom, you have individualized where it's, it's most deterritorialized, you can say, and you can, in one way to interpret the results is to think of them analogical to uh, Fernand Braudel's distinction between three levels of economic life. Uh, subsistence at the lowest level, market as a form of collectivized enterprise, and uh, what he terms real capitalism, uh, which is uh, uh, corollary to the syndicated uh, way of organizing. Now, if we see the modal share of this organization for each year in Karail, we can use this diagram to represent the morphogenesis. We can see that in the earliest period, the first settlers were individualized, uh, motivated by a desire for foothold in an otherwise inhospitable city. The desire to survive acted at an individual level. Any collective effort for the settlers seemed irrational since the desire was set within a narrative of temporariness. Now with increasing time, that's 2004, five, six, as they lived in Karail longer, the desire started shifting. During the middle period, collectivization became dominant and it was through a desire for living well rather than living for survival. And this was by old and new settlers. Production of shared facilities such as streets and institutions were done through collective negotiation reinforcing a sense of belonging to the community. More recently, syndication has become the primary mode with few local leaders empowered by external authorities slowly overtook the larger share of production process. The fundamental desire behind the syndicated organization became profiteering at the expense of public land. A consumer class was effectively constituted instead of an active settler community. 
if you remember the growth spurt in 2014 that I'd say I'd bring it up. Now, it was the year of the national election and the newly elected national political leaders who had utilized the local muscle and vote bank in Karail legitimized the syndicated organization at a much higher level than ever before causing the growth spurt. Now, uh, this brings us to what kinds of relations are underlying this urban production? And I'll very briefly go over this. And this is the framework that you see is drawn from Foucault's and Deleuze's notion of power over versus power to. And that's one way to conceptualize the different entanglements in Karel. And I see it as a spectrum uh, from, of relations that on one hand enable, affirm uh, the processes to relations of the other extreme that negate or constrain the urban processes. And I suggest four particular modes of entanglement. Now, at the two extreme ends, on, on, the, on the left, there are relations that are highly constraining. For example, the state's desire for a planned and ordered city, a city without slums, creates forms of entrapment for the residents in which there is a perpetual fear of eviction without just resettlement. Now, this has been attempted multiple times already in Karail. The desire of the residents for a better life becomes suspended, trapped within the narratives of the state providing housing for all eventually, which has significantly actually inhibited the urban production. On the other hand, the most emancipatory forms of relation that have been established, that have been established when the desires of the residents are given legitimacy through legal help, uh, for example, by legal help by large scale civil society organizations, or particularly when there have been mass movements across different classes fighting for their right to stay and for their right to occupy the land. A concrete example of that in terms of morphogenesis would be the large number of landholders in Karail upgraded their housing to brick and mortar following the 2012 court ruling which barred the state from carrying out eviction uh, without proper resettlement. Now, towards the middle of the spectrum, on a more quoted that quotidian, everyday level, there are alignments of desires between the smaller scale bodies in adjacent neighborhoods and the residents in Karail. And this is key to generating the livelihoods and fostering the morphogenesis. Now, what do I mean by that? For example, the desire for a cheap on-demand mobility by the urban middle class manifests as the rickshaw industry in places like Karel. The desire for goods sold at your doorstep in the formal city creates an informal vendor economy based in such settlements. The waste of the formal city becomes the supply chain for the recycling industry. But perhaps the most potent example of how desires can align was the reconstruction effort following a fire in 2017, in which NGOs, volunteers, civil society actors, and the residents came together, resulting in perhaps the fastest morphological production, 5,000 houses rebuilt in a matter of weeks. And most interestingly, one of the participants in that process was the state itself. The green roofs you see were mostly donated by uh, the, the state and uh, international organizations. Now, Lastly, uh, to the left, there are times when desires of different bodies oppose and resulting in minor constraints in the urban production process. For an example, the desire to avoid seeing the slum resulted and stopping the encroachment, quote unquote, resulted in a wall being built along Skarail's edge in 2009 by the adjacent state office, which of course stopped certain pedestrian and material flows. But as you can see by 2019 on the lower left, the residents had adapted to the wall, cut holes in them, even built over them to continue the everyday life. Now, I have spoken about the morphogenesis, about the organizing processes and relation in terms of desires. And I'd like to end on that note. The largest changes in urban morphology in Karail can often be explained by tracing the way the desires change. The most prescient example is the large-scale self-upgrading program done by the citizens in 2017, where in a matter of months, thousands of owners retracted 
the front of their houses to allow for the laneways to widen. Now, although many NGOs had previously attempted to pursue such road widening programs for decades, most failed due to the owners not negotiating. That changed in 2017 after the large fire had gutted thousands of homes. Now, interestingly, even in neighborhoods that were not touched by the fire, what the event of the fire did was it shifted the narrative of what was acceptable as the minimum road width. The neighborhoods went through a collective reflection, organized themselves, and agreed to self-upgrade their narrow lanes, forsaking the previous desire to cling on to even an inch of land. The morphogenesis was an after effect of a shift in their landscape of desire. So all the entanglements or, and organizations behind Corral's morphogenesis that have tried to cover today are such manifestations emerging from intersecting desires by bodies across different scales, different times, and different natures. Or if I had to put it simply, the thesis has traced how in Karail form follows desire. Uh, and this is the last slide, I promise. Uh, where do these findings from this thesis take us? I mean, what are the new lines of opening? And what are the implications? So, a case study such as this can only go so far in drawing generalizations. However, I'd like to end with a series of questions uh, that I hope the thesis can only begin to answer. On one hand, I suggest that the findings have theoretical implications, adding conceptual uh, frameworks to the current understanding of cities and urban form, and in particular, informal settlements. I see the thesis, I hope the thesis has demonstrated the usefulness of assemblage thinking to synergize the social and the spatial and to show how morphology plays an act active role in forming societal relations as not relegated to the background. On the other hand, I suggest that there are implications for how we engage with such settlements now and in future. The findings here point towards ways we might learn to guide and upgrade existing settlements, stop overdevelopment, and enable forms of collectivization. Now, these insights can equally inform an anticipatory form of planning and design of future cities where informality, now this is crucial, informality is seen both as the paradoxical condition that can escalate into unjust social, socio-spatial relations, but equally has the potential to inform an equitable and participatory urbanism. Uh, so I think I overstepped the time a bit, so. But. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tansel. I can hear a collective round of silent applause. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes for discussion, which is going to be tight because there's quite a few uh, uh, questions already logged on the, uh, the chat. But before we go there, I just wanted to say, I, I, I will let this discussion go across the hour and so that I know people will uh, need to disappear. So I want to say, first of all, thank you all very much for coming along and I won't interrupt it uh, again when that comes. Um, I also wanted to say this has been the, the first of our, um, uh, what will be a, a, a regular uh, set of seminars in the Info series that will continue later and you'll hear more about that series um, later in the year, that's within the next few weeks or so. Um, I want to first of all throw this to the um, uh, committee and my co-supervisor. Uh, so this is uh, Brian, David uh, and Ross as to whether they have any uh, comments or questions. Uh, this is indeed the, 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 the formal final um, seminar for Tunzel's PhD. And so I just want to ask them if they want to say anything or ask anything. And if they don't, then we'll, uh, David, you have to unmute. Yeah, hi, Tanzil. Um, hi. Other than really great and excellent and stuff like that, I just wondered, uh, I, really, your modal share diagram is very stunning. And I was wondering whether you have a, uh, a kind of reason behind that or why you think that takes place. And in particular, whether that's organic, in other words, due to primarily to what's going on inside, or whether this shift to the third mode um, which I, I forget the name that you've given it, is a result of the fact yeah. that it's embedded in a, in a larger city which operates in that more capitalist mode. We're taking Brodel's uh, 
Mm. Uh, thanks about. for the question. So one way to see that is initially the settlement is not in any, it's not in the public gaze. It, it's not part of the political dialogue. But over time, as, as it gathers steam, so to speak, and it more population, it becomes more significant in the city politics. It becomes, uh, you know, it becomes something that you can negotiate and you can, it's, it's all, it develops a capacity for negotiation. And that's how over time, it becomes implicated in the larger city politics. So initially it's like a backyard, which eventually becomes a more foreground of politics playing out. So I see that it's not, uh, that's why, you know, the, the settlement physical boundary wouldn't matter because over time what it has become is it has become territorialized, let's say, as part of the larger political, you know, dynamics that's going on. Uh, and that's the, the, the result is the forms of syndication that spans across the informal settlement into the formal governance, into the formal political parties and all of that. Thanks, Tanzil, and I'll thank you for both the questioners and Tanzil to keep this uh, relatively brief because we've got quite a few to get through. Did Ross or Brian want to say something? Brian? Thanks, Tanzil. Uh, really good. It's been, it's, it's so nice to see it come together. Uh, for me, there's um, your theoretical basis, the conceptualization that you outlined at the beginning in terms of assemblage, talks about relations, talks about no boundaries, no binaries, the kind of classic assemblage thinking. And yet the analysis is very spatially bound and your interpretation of it is also quite static with boundaries and with place. And, and I'm curious about how you dealt with the tension between a conceptualization that would say a lot of these lines should be or thought of as porous and, and how you then interpret and, and deal with the analysis of this. Because for me, it was, there's so much to grapple with that I'm curious about um, how your conceptualization deals with this case, where space seems to be so paramount. Now, it's interesting that you bring that up because often the connotation is, if I'm mapping a material, it can only exist in one place. But assemblage thinking would be like, it would be, would contradict that notion because one thing can be multiple, multiply connected. Now, I have always found out that's very difficult to map. I, mean, I have tried actually mapping the relations, but then, I mean, imagine, like, for example, an ideal map would be how all the different migrants coming from the farthest corners of the country are embedded in the morphogenesis and how their particular knowledge how it maps onto the different parts. Now, I know I tried doing that, but then of course, there is a methodological limitation of specializing, you know, uh, some of the more intangible things. So of course there's that, but there is a deeper question that you have asked and that is more uh, related to the ontological framing. Now, if, now I can unpick that because I didn't go into the detail, but if I, you may have noticed that I stopped using the word type. I never use the word type because I use the word tendencies. Now, tendencies and types, there is a clear ontological distinction. I am not dividing up the world into different types. So these are not different types of organization. I mean, they can, you know, the complexity of the world is that things can be simultaneous and things can be multiple. I mean, that's what Deleuze specifically talks about, that try to describe the world with and. This is, you know, uh, political and this is social and this is economic and so in the same sense let's let's say for example let's let's take if i give you a very concrete example the large-scale ngos that have given microfinance to PRAC. now you can see that as a form of uh, emancipatory you know relationship it is you know uh, liberating their desire to build but equally it's a form of entrapment as well I mean, these microfinance institutions charge a high uh, interest and then these people become in, you know, entrapped within that as well. So the way I see how BRAC's involvement, it's both. So it's not either or. So the way that these conceptual categories map out on the world actually is always through this, this junctions and contradictions and this uh, juxtapositions, uh, which uh, I know I just didn't have really time to go into that. <laughs> 
concept uh, of I'll leave time and we can follow up on that later. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Uh, again, could I my, please be brief. Uh, uh, Ross, did you have comment? We can't hear you. Uh, you need to unmute. No, now you're muted. I think it's uh, the microphone setting or something. Sorry, Ross, you're muted. Okay, um, we're going to go to the list of uh, questioners. The first of them was uh, Pippa. Oh, it was just a quick one. I was wondering how the rate of development and the rate of change might compare to Australia. That's just, you know. I mean, uh, yeah, that's very interesting because I think uh, th these are not only bound in informal settlements. These notions of, you know, syndication. We live in a syndicated city. I mean, we live in that neoliberal syndication all the time. That's why you have little say in, you know, how your neighborhood street layouts are going to be organized. So we are far into that spectrum and to the right. That's how I see it. That's my interpretation. So in terms of the rates, um, I would say that, of course, Australian urban design would be, of course, in a much, it has, it has always been a form of colonial, a highly territorialized colonial form of urban design. So it's, it's a large power play in that sense. And I, I don't think it has always had the privilege to be in a more emancipatory, collectivized middle. But, but that's what planners are trying to do, is to move it back towards a more participatory, more collectivized, more commoning uh, end. So I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, I, mean, I don't know how to compare the rates. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Tanzil. We're gonna, we're gonna move right along. Uh, Lutfan Lata, uh, you're still there? You still have a question? Hi, Kim. Yes, I have a, still have a question. Um, excellent presentation, Tanzil. And David kind of asked the question I wanted to ask, but I have a uh, extension of that question. So I'm just interested uh, whether you have asked um, people when they have been evicted from the, their place and when they come back, whether they could grab the same land, like what happens? How did this syndicated portion, uh, kind of the number of syndicated houses uh, increased? Mm -hmm. So is it because they lost, like when eviction took place, they lost their land and these mustangs and other people grab those lands or they can get back to their lands. What's happening? So I'm not sure whether you yeah. asked this question, I mean, but yeah, thanks. Now, again, I mean, there is no binary answer. There are extreme cases where, imagine that when there was a fire and you know, it was all burnt and you were like, oh, let me go and live with my mom in the village for one month and come back. You'll probably like find your land, piece of land is gone. You know, the neighbor took it over. I mean, it doesn't have to be the syndicate coming okay. and taking it. But that's why you will see a very curious special manifestation. People after the fire, they hang their mosquito net and stay on the same land because it's so physically embedded. Like if you leave the physical land, you will actually lose it. So there is a fear of that. Uh, so after eviction, it all comes down to how much social capital you have. So you could be really, you know, uh, if you have good relationship, even with the syndicated members, and you have a large chunk of land, you can retain it. But if you don't have that protection and that's insurance, you know, you are more prone to your land being, you know, uh, you know, you know, taken away for that process. So it, it's both. Uh, it's not one or the other. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's great. Okay, and a question from Amon. Uh, thank you, Tenzo. Um, I understand you've got a background in urban design and architecture and I feel, I, I sort of observed that your values, I guess, um, st st uh, steered the, the project all the way through. And I wondered uh, whether or not you have a reflection about, about some of maybe critical reflection about the place and whether or not you've got a set of uh, values uh, for urban design and architecture um, that, that might be able to be expressed. Is there three or four of them, for instance? Um, can we assess these informal settlements in terms of their efficacy around those values or implementation of those values as a design professional, as an academic teaching design, etc. cetera. Oh, thanks, Simon, for that. Um, now, I think, I mean, I'll start from a very conceptual point. Uh, you know, Putnam talks about the is-ought fallacy, right? The notion that a fact cannot determine uh, normative values. And I don't bind to that. I mean, as with all binaries, it's gray. So 
yes, I have described facts, but you can draw out a set of normative values from that. I mean, if you go in Kerala and you ask people, they will tell you that the most, uh, you know, uh, the best time that they had in Kerala was during 2008. I mean, that's when things were the most collectivized. There were no political, there were the least political, uh, you know, uh, least amount of political influence because there was in 2008, like a coup by the military and no one bothered to, you know, bothered with Kerala. So there were no political parties effectively for two years. And you can start to see and link it with the notion, let's say for Ostrom, because if you go into that uh, academic discussion and you can start to see why we, you know, in the same way that why do we promote participation in architecture or why do we want a more participatory forms of governance and planning and design that of course you would want, therefore, you know, from my PhD, I would of course try to enable forms of collectivization, you know, try to bring it, steer it to the middle you know, the, the two extremes in either case, you know, are where people become subjugated either by top-down authority or by any lack of, or, or, you know, by lack of harmony between them. Or, so, of course, there is uh, that normative middle that hopefully that it can bring towards. And as a metric for urban design and or assessing informal settlements, I mean, if I now go to an informal settlement, I'd be really looking for what sort of organization is happening you know, immediately, you know, uh, that's what, you know, those tripartite way, that's tripartite lens would be my way of trying to look at the processes going on. And then of course, I'll look at the larger city and its relations through the metric of the relationship, you know, the spectrum of relations that I presented. So they will become, they, they can be used methodologically. I mean, that's what, you know, of course, that's, uh, you know, for other researchers and for myself to explore out in the world, if that holds. Okay, well, thanks, Tansel. We'll move to Stephanie Butcher. Thanks. I think there's also one um, you might want to come back to, Tansel, on gender in the, in the chat as well. Um, oh. but I'll, I'll just ask mine quickly, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, I just, from, from your, you know, I know you kind of have this sort of scholar activist hat. Um, and so I was just curious if maybe you could reflect a little bit on, um, you know, like the ways in which mapping has become a very profound tool for the sort of scholar activist. Um, I wonder if you could reflect on what you think this sort of morpho, morpho well, I can't say it, morphological um, analysis adds as a kind of tool for that type of engaged or activist work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Stephanie, thanks for that. So, I mean, I think mapping, like for example, my experience, I can only speak from my experience. So the participatory mapping workshop that I did, and also when I uh, finished the mapping, you know, the digital mapping and I took it back in physical and print out. And then, you know, when I was doing, you know, giving it back to the community, there is a palpable sense of, you know, visualizing something that you have, you know, have lived in, but there is, that's strangely empowering because it brings in people together. They can identify. It's a way of, you know, uh, saying that's my house. Otherwise, which they didn't really have. Now, very specifically, I know that, I mean, I see Gunter Nest here and they have been doing some, you can look up their work. They have been doing amazing community-based uh, mapping. But what I will say my particular contribution is, is for example, the 10-year mapping. Now, one of the biggest issues is when there is resettlement, there is no way to know how much you want to, you know, someone own 10 rooms. So you, you know, compensate for 10 rooms, you know. Uh, there is no way of knowing because there is no cadastral, there is nothing. So uh, a comprehensive tenure map would actually go a lot in a way of registering those, you know, what people have contributed their lives and, you know, their, uh, the built form and actually can be used as a tool for justice to of ensuring that no one gets left out because that's the biggest problem in resettlement. The syndicates always claim that that was all ours. So I need to get, you know, uh, compensated. And the, the person, let's say with one room, who has no paperwork, nothing, and everything is broken down. He has nothing. So for example, when I gave back the tenure maps and all of that to the community for using those as a form of negotiation. Uh, and one last answer is anyone who goes to work in Karayal, they spend half of their budget mapping the place, always. That's like a rule of thumb. So I said, you know, they, if they say that they want to map, 
you know, use these maps because they are geographically accurate. So they can be used for uh, construction purposes or, you know, as such, and also for social purposes. So don't allow them to, you know, try to comp negotiate the budget to be more focused on the actual project rather than the survey and the mapping. So these would be like concrete ways I see this helping uh, social justice issues. Okay, thanks Tanzil. And uh, thanks Stephanie for pointing out that I missed someone in the list. It's Ash Aman. Ash? Uh, hi Kim, uh, can you hear me please? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm connecting from New Zealand. Uh, thanks, Tanjil. Uh, anybody working in Bangladeshi context, especially with slums, I know how hard it is to research on coral. So you have done an excellent job and I understand that you are uh, looking into coral from a very specific disciplinary background, such as architecture. So uh, spatial analysis, I can see the, uh, I think, normativity of it. But uh, I was just thinking about uh, how gender contributed to uh, that kind of desire and the morphogenesis because uh, from my own research in uh, slums in Kulna, uh, I found that there have been, uh, I think, a distinct and a strong desire uh, from women or women led collective uh, where uh, women have formed collective with NGOs. They have a strong desire then uh, those groups led by male members to uh, sort of like negotiate their space, claim their space. So I understand like you have done a lot of mapping, but have you sort of like uh, tried to, or have you found anything in relation to gender, like how this mapping, like how mm. these negotiations are actually uh, sort of like governed by women or men? Like, is there any particular comparison that you can draw on? Yep. I mean, thanks that you picked it up and it's also answering to Stephanie. I mean, I, I, I did not go into that. I, I really tried to keep it within the, you know, disciplinary, let's say, of urban design. But I mean, I can category, uh, categorically answer you. So for example, the first savings groups in Karel were started by women. And, and uh, so in 1998, I mean, from since then, women have been really instrumental because it, it is much more uh, likely that the loans given out to women are spent actually on the built forms or the upgrading rather than men. Now, mm. if that's the case, imagine the scenario now, because this has been exploited. So for example, now in Kerala, men will send their wives to the NGOs because they know their wives are going to get the loans. So yep. this knowledge yep. has become an instrumentation of power and it's, a, it's, mm. you know, it's reversed. So in a way, you know, you bring your wife from the village and then you say, go and say these things and you're going to get the money, bring it back to me. So imagine that that has been actually, you know, perverted, let's say, in a way. And in terms of the actual morphology, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, I don't know if Hurera is watching today. Uh, Hurera has been work in Karail. It showed categorically, which I can, uh, I can verify, is how women-led uh, built form actually morphologically is a bit different. I mean, women tend to have more care spaces. They have more uh, care towards privacy issues. So the built form shows, let's say, indirect entries. It shows a lot, a, a, you know, the desire to keep a courtyard, you know, the desire to keep uh, spaces that are helpful for the everyday uh, activities. So in a way, when you see it from a gendered lens, of course, the specialities are different and the desires are different. Now, you can yes. actually distinguish between that and how it's impacted. But of course, that's a trajectory. I mean, it would be a great paper that I could actually collaborate with Stephanie and you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tanjil. Okay, we're, gonna, we're packing a lot into this session. Uh, I'm gonna say this is gonna be the last question. There's an awful lot of interest and in, we've had like, I think it was about 60 people at some point. So that's great um, audience for you, um, Tanzil. Um, but uh, Sakib Chowdhury, I think this will be the last question. Sakib. Yes. Uh, hello, Tanzil Bhai. Excellent presentation, I must say. Uh, my question uh, can be traced a uh, little less academic, but, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it would be related to policy making. Uh, how do you feel this kind of thesis can be um, traced back to the government authorities 
to take more humane policies for these uh, root label peoples. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. I mean, uh, thank you uh, for the question. I didn't go into the detail, but now the, you know that the uh, more natural response is to say, I'm going to go and uh, note, you know, talk to the ministers in charge or, you know, show them this presentation and convince them that's what's happening. But I think that's, uh, you know, good intention, but really not effective. I think the power lies with people. I think we have to go to the people. We really need to, you know, revive these forms of collectivization. We need to show how power operates in every single instance. And, and the, the best policies would actually come from participation with people and, and exchange of knowledges. I mean, you know, me learn, you know, telling them what I've learned from them and they telling them how things work in real world. And so as an academic, I mean, I, you know, uh, I'm scheduled to go back to Bangladesh, uh, hopefully in June and July. And of course, I want to go back to Karail and, and have, you know, continue that relationship and discussion. Because for me, and I mentioned this in my methodology chapter, that reciprocity with the people does not end with my thesis. It's, it's a lifelong commitment. And I can see, uh, you know, uh, some other researchers here who actually think in the same way. And uh, that's why, you know, if you're an assemblage thinker, it's very hard to separate out things. So of course, yes, this is my thesis and academic paper, but I'd like to see what happens in Karel. I want to be embedded in those, you know, power relations in those, you know, practices and then be on the side of people. Now, when I say people, I mean not the syndicate and not the individualized. I mean people when they are at their best, when they're collectivized uh, to survive, you know, to live well. So, I mean, that would be my response, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, okay Tom. So we have gone well over time. Um, I blame you, but uh, I, I can blame everybody else for being so interested in the topic. So thank you all again for coming along and uh, call this to a close and say thank you very much again to Tanzil for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much.